I work for the Community Based Health Promotion and Prevention Studies Group in Cairns. This, focuses, this presentation focuses on the alcohol related violence linked to licensed premises in the nighttime economy slash late night entertainment precinct in Cairns. Other projects our group work on include cannabis demand reduction in partnership with the Queensland Police Service, uh, tobacco smoking cessation and we're looking at an evaluation, uh, an evaluation strategy into the alcohol management plans in the Cape York communities. So we're going to cover three topics today. Thanks. In 2010, we studied whether it was feasible to collect information about any and all incidents of person-to-person -person non sexual violence in the nighttime economy in, in Cairns, whether and how the best way to share that information with key stakeholders in the community who either had an interest in preventing that violence or responding to that violence or had a mandate to do either of those things. And the feasibility study was funded by the National Drug Law Enforcement Research Fund, so I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their work. The second part, and this will be quite brief because we've just started it basically, uh, we currently take, research has just started evaluating the uptake of interventions by different agencies to reduce the sort of violence. And it's also, this whole thing is basically a case study into the power of supplying community with methodologically rigorous, theoretically based information and seeing what sort of changes occur within the community system as a result of that. I'll talk briefly also about a couple of other independent research projects that came about as a result of the feasibility study. They're focused on venue security providers and the preventative capacity of the open space, closed circuit television, networking cans. So thanks again guys. So yeah, the feasibility study in 2010 has basically established and demonstrated a coordinated data collection methodology from the Queensland Police Service, the Emergency Department of Cairns Base Hospital, Cairns Regional Council's Closed Circuit TV Network and security providers to licensed venues. It required identification of a number of complexities within each agency, welcome, uh, and negotiation to overcome complexities in collecting that de-identified data as well. So that took a lot of those complexities, once we got to understand what the needs of each agency were, were quite easy to overcome, um, but I'll talk more about that as well. But the, there's been calls, the most recent call that I'm aware of is the Queensland Parliament, Parliamentary Inquiry into Alcohol Related Violence in the CBD, but it's been echoed for a number of years across jurisdic jurisdictions in Australia and by the Institute of Criminology as well for better data collection around, around these assaults, the rate, the precursors and what happens with them. It's also a priority area for the World Health Organisation. They've got a quite a strong violence prevention focus as well. We've taken a very applied focus that makes the evidence available to the key stakeholders in the system. Uh, and the data collection, has, we've taken an epidemiological approach. I've worked for a number of years as a crime prevention, community-based crime prevention practitioner. I uh, now work for the School of Public Health and there's a lot of interesting methodological offerings that public health can give to criminology, I think, from seeing this. It's also interesting noticing the pragmatic value with the data we've identified and identifying the patterns within that data and offering that back to stakeholder, stakeholders that really tell us with their experience and that's sort of strengthened their relationship with this data collection and the whole project as well. Uh, and I'll also briefly touch on comparing our prospective real-time data collection with a retrospective chart analysis study that was done in the Cairns Base Hospital Emergency Department of all alcohol related assault presentations over six months just to show the difference in the methodologies for those ones and the, and the potential for the enhanced data collection. So yeah, there are a number of questions we had to answer or ask before we even started. What does define assault? The criminal code in Queensland is different from what the emergency departments in Queensland use to define assault. That's different from what CCTV camera operators define as assault, alcohol related assault incident and that's different from what the security providers also do in their incident logs. They're required by law to record all major incidents in their logs. So they're all different sort of things. We looked at all of those things and got, and through my networks previously, I had a uh, good understanding of sort of the different ways different agencies came at that. So we defined the data of interest that we were looking at for our study, which was basically all incidents of person-to-person non-sexual violence that occurred within the Cairns CBD precinct that weren't linked to homelessness or any specific domestic violence things and they had to be linked to licensed premises as well. Second complexity is finding out where they happen 
so what do we actually mean by the Cairns Late Night Entertainment Precinct or the Cairns Nighttime Economy? And we also looked at what interventions may work. Uh, so yep, we sought permission and got permission from the Queensland Health, Cairns and Hinterland Human Ethics Committee and also from the Queensland Police Services Ethical Standards Command Research Committee to conduct research on site and with various officers. But an addition, additional important one, even though we had university ethics approval, uh, it was offered by the Cairns City Licensee Safety Association, which are key, key stakeholders and drivers of the liquor accord up there, that if there was a memorandum of understanding between the university and between themselves, then they would be more open to supplying information along these lines. So we did up an MOU, ran it past our lawyers, and I think that was a really strong way to overcome that potential blockage with the Licensees Association. So once the approval was received, we conducted 29 semi-structured interviews and the respondents are listed in that table. So we tried to capture every, everyone in the stakeholder system. And the interviews were loosely themed around the impact of alcohol-related violence on their agency's workload, how they collected data relating to it at the moment, the potential to share data with other agencies, the awareness of existing interventions to address this sort of violence both within their agency and community level and within other agencies as well, and whether they were aware of any research into the economic cost of this sort of violence to their agency. That one was no, just a blanket no, no one's aware of any economic research into the cost of alcohol-related assaults. So yeah, we asked, um, is collaboration possible for sharing information about the nature and occurrence of assault episodes? And is it possible to develop targeted strategies? What strategy components should be used? How should strategies be developed? Uh, who should be involved and how should they be implemented? And the last question was a triangulation, just who else should we talk to to see, you know, to try and capture everyone. And defining, defining the late night entertainment precinct as we call it, or the nighttime economy in Cairns, was quite, quite an interesting thing. There was a, basically we provided everyone with a map of the city and they hand drew the boundaries on it. We asked them also to hand draw where any hotspots were and to contextualise the reasons for that. So the police, venue security providers, liquor licensing, um, other liquor record venue, other liquor record involvers like liquor license, oh sorry I said liquor licensing, but um, council staff, hospital staff and others drew the boundaries and the violence hotspots on the map we provided. There's a very high level of consensus between uh, the boundaries and also the hotspots. That's very, very high level of consensus. There was an interesting variation between agencies as to what people saw as the boundaries. For example, so between that different level of consensus between agencies, within different agencies though, the people who are involved in this sort of area had a high level of consensus as well. For example, liquor licensing and the venue owners included this bit, which no one else did. The hospital emergency department staff all just basically <laughs> drew one block here. That one there is the taxi rank. Uh, but an unexpected finding too was these ones, these are the pedestrian egress routes out of town. So there's a lot of backpacker accommodation venues up there. So as people leave town, there's also less, it wasn't really significant, but there was also some other pedestrian egress routes out this way towards more suburban area as well. So that was an unexpected finding and it fits in with a couple of different uh, theories. Within that as well, there was a few people identified the pedestrian egress routes between the different venues, uh, food, food places, and that was where the hotspots, the violence hotspots occurred. Uh, you can see there, pretty much all directly outside venues or at intersections. There are 26 venues licensed to trade after midnight on a Friday night in Cairns and after lock out at 3am there's still eight premises licensed to hold 4,642 people. So that's the potential, that's the population for potential assaults in Cairns. Just to put that into some context, Cairns has a residential population of about 165,000 people. Uh, but it's, I don't know if you've heard, but it's a, that, sorry, that's my attempt at humour, welcome. <laughs> but uh, it's also an international and domestic tourist location as well. So we had 550,000 visitor nights last year, of which 27% came from the UK. Some of the suggested interventions from interviews are listed here. These are only the ones about 30% and above. 
as a, and as an initial analysis of the qualitative data. Um, we're writing up a number of papers based on this study at the moment, so I won't get too much into some of the things, but it's interesting to note that every person, every person, in addition to the 29 formal semi-structured interviews, we conducted another five open discussions, basically, that weren't actually document they were documented, but they weren't analysed in the same way. Uh, and that was just for, for reasons relating to those agencies. But it's interesting to note that every person we spoke to talked about a change in a generational change in drinking and a culture of determined drunkenness coming up. There was also 20% of people talked about educating magistrates for higher penalties. Another 20% talked about targeting repeat offenders and banning them from the late night entertainment precinct uh, under a liquor record strategy, which has since been implemented. Another 20% talked about ID scanners in clubs, so you go before you're allowed in, you show your licence, it gets recorded, and that's linked with the uh, banning of repeat offenders. And some other stuff, another 10% of people talked about distributing breathalysers for people to breathalyse themselves at around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in the city place or within venues. And there was a couple of emergency department nurses, and this is the only place this came from, but they thought it was a great idea was to do some naming and shaming strategy and have a wall of shame and texting people's parents when they had to come and pick them up from the emergency department. Another interesting finding is that uh, there was some comment that different venues attract different types of clientele. For example, on a rhythm and blues night, they can guarantee there can be trouble, they said. And so where the groups mixed in those pedestrian pathways and the egress points is where the violence tends to occur. So that was the qualitative side. The quantitative data collection was the other part of the feasibility study, or in addition with the feeding the information back to the agencies and the stakeholders. So the critical processes in the quantitative data collection, it was all about the relationships in the end. It was all about getting in there. We conducted observational sessions, staff educational workshops, getting people to have buy-in about how this project could reduce their workload basically and getting an understanding of the complexities that these people have to face and how to overcome those things so that they'd be happy to collect the data, linking that back to if you do collect this data then we can offer it community-wide interventions or agency-specific interventions that can reduce your workload over time. So there were a number of previous relationships that we hooked into, and, and but the new relationships were specifically with the emergency department, so that was a totally new thing. And we did different agencies have been trying to get into the emergency department, and I'll talk more about that later on. But that was a big thing. The identification of potential patient records was a big issue as well for them, but we overcame that quite quickly and very early on by use, collecting de identified data. I'll talk more about the details about that as well. Everyone we spoke to said they were sick of it, you know, emergency department nurses, doctors, police, community safety officers, security officers, they're all just sick of it and so they were keen and they became champions within their own agencies to go out and sell it to people. Uh, and we also provided some research evidence to help build that relationship about, you know, there's research, Australian research and UK research that shows that during peak periods up to 70% of emergency department presentations are alcohol-related assault. Um, yep, a lot of people are very frustrated uh, and staff safety is also a very important issue in the emergency department as well. Intoxicated people presenting, frustrated, have been assaulted or involved in a violent altercation. And then the last stage of the preliminary thing was getting all the stakeholders in a room together at the Cairns Base Hospital and saying this is how we're looking at doing it matching on time, place, location, sorry, time and location and date and some other sort of demographic things so that if you, each of you of the four agencies provide us with this information we can have a reasonably good estimation that this thing identified, this assault incident identified by these three different agencies is the same assault incident so we reduced double counting through that and we worked through that, that took uh, about six hours but it was very valuable 